Although sometimes in Chicago it doesn't matter what the color is, they go through anyway. So you got, you got to stop at the green just in case they're coming through on the red on the other side. But anyway, um, I was fortunate I grew up in a Grace home. I understood the Grace message from a child. And um, I understood that Paul was my apostle. I understood that um, how God wrote the Bible, how there was Israel and there's some passages and some, some books that God wrote to Israel. And that how God raised up Paul and he, and he gave a, a message to Paul. And it's in Paul that we find our message. And so I was very fortunate to, to grow up with that. And uh, very helpful. That's why I'm always, um, when I meet new believers or believers that come out of, you know, Catholicism or out of the, you know, any of your normal denominations, I'm always inquisitive about what caused you to see the light? What caused you to see the truth? And because I never had to come out of, some denomination. I never had to come out of, you know, some, some wrong, you know, I'm not saying we were right all the time, but we understood how God wrote the Bible. And it, it's fascinating, I was just talking to a, a lady a, a little while ago, and we understand dispensationalism, how that God uh, gave some words to different people throughout the Bible, and they're all recorded in the Bible, but they're not all for us to follow. And I was talking to her about this dispensational aspect of viewing the Bible, and she was like, oh, I take the whole Bible. I take it all. And you know, that's not true. And I told her, you're a dispensationalist true, too. And she's like, no, I'm not. I'm like, yeah, you are. She's like, no, I take the whole Bible. I'm like, no, are, are you going to go home on Saturday night and slay a lamb in your backyard for your sins? Well, no. Well, I can take you over to Leviticus and show you where you have to do that. Well, hum and a hum and a hum. I say, well, you're a dispensationalist. Are you building an ark in your backyard because God told you it's going to flood? No. Well, that proves you're a dispensationalist. See, we're all dispensationalists when we come to the Bible. The point is, is where do you divide the Bible? That's the true thing. So these people who tell you that, oh, dispensationalist is, is, you know, is, is wrong and, and every, they're dispensationalists too. It's just like there's no true atheists out there. Every man believes in a God. Atheists would just lie to your face. Just like, you know, I've, I've had conversations with atheists and after a long enough time you talk to them, they admit there's a God, but they're mad at them for something. We'll talk maybe more about that tomorrow if we get to that. But anyway, everybody's a dispensationalist. So it's where do you divide your Bible? So I was fortunate to grow up understanding that God raised up Paul and he committed some, some commandments to Paul. And Paul went out as the apostle to the Gentiles. And now those of us in the age of grace are to listen to Paul and his commandments. And that's where we find our gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So it's really nice being in the place with people that understand all that. And I don't have to worry about certain things because I know you're all right there. Hopefully. <laughs> well, you should be. Because that's where God is. And if you want to be where God is, you're going to want to do what God says. Just like, you know, Adam was in the garden. Can you imagine this? Adam in the garden. God tells Adam, stay in the garden and till it. Okay, Adam's doing that. Having fun. Planting the flowers, looking at all of God's great stuff in the garden. Eating. Then Adam sins, and God comes to him and says, get out of the garden. Well, Adam had a choice to make. God told him to do two different things, didn't he? One to stay and one to get out. wonder if Adam said, I don't want to get out. I'm going to stay right here. He would have been disobedient to God's word. But yet, both those things were God's word, right? You have to understand what God's telling you today. Can you imagine if Adam got kicked out of the garden and God physically threw him out? And then Adam tried to get back in. You know what would have happened to him? That sword there on fire, I think, would have done him in. Have you guys ever thought about this? And we're not even on topic yet, but this is just for fun. Can you imagine? Do you ever think about the. I got a book on Cain and Abel in the back there. And I'm going to talk more about our ministry a little bit later and maybe more tomorrow. And if you got questions, you can ask me. Um, but just thinking about that sword. That Garden of Eden existed for a very long time back then. And let's say you were born four or five generations down the line before the flood. That garden was still there. And that sword was still there. Can you imagine your mom taking you on a field trip to go see the sword? I, mean, you th I See, I think about those things. You know, if I was Adam's like fifth or sixth generation grandson, and you're living over here who knows where, and they say, hey, Let's go see the garden where Adam was from. That would have been sort of cool, wouldn't it? 
Have you ever, I don't know, maybe I think, I know I do think weird and different than most people, but that's okay. My wife still married me anyway. <laughs> yes, yes. The love of my life and she got me. All of me. <laughs> Little did she know. Um, but that would, be, that would have been a cool field trip to go see the sword. Well, anyway, what are we going to do today? Okay, so I did the intro. I'm Gary Miller. You all know that. That's my wife, Lori. I have three kids. They're all at home. I got a 23-year-old son, Luke. I got a 22-year-old daughter, Sarah, and a 20-year-old daughter, Grace. Now, I got to think of their ages. I'm really bad with ages. But, um, and they're all single. Anyway, I got their pictures too, if you want to see them. <laughs> Not advertising, just saying. They are sort of nice, and um, they're normal. They're not like their dad. They got the genes from the mom, so they're, they're more even keel, and they do good. So um, anyway, besides that, if any of you know, have grandkids or, or whatever, feel free to contact us. Anyway, today, what are we going to do? Um, we're going to talk about some of the basics of what Christian life is about. We're going to talk about what faith is. Now, we're all people of faith, but I'm one of those people that like to really look and see how faith works, the mechanics of faith. Now, we all understand, you know, we, we've all put our faith in Jesus Christ, hopefully. If we haven't, hopefully by the end of this service you will, because um, we're going to make the point and the case for that. But what is faith? And you see, when you talk to the people of the world and you, you say, you know, you, you, you believe, they look at you like you're nuts. Like, they, they look and, and, and think that faith is something that's just superstitious, we're crazy, it's silly, because the world likes to look at things that are empirical, that are real, that they can put their hands on. And, and usually when people think of faith, they think of just blindly following something that you really don't have any assurance of, and that... You're just dumb, basically, is what it is. They look at you like, oh, you're one of those people of faith. No, we're going to investigate today what faith is, and we're going to see how all men have faith. In fact, God designed man to have faith and to use faith, and we use it in everyday actions that we do. Let's turn over to um, Romans chapter 4. Oh. I did bring this book up here for a purpose, we'll, as you're turning to Romans chapter 4. This is my newest book on creation. We'll talk more about it a little bit later. It's hot off the press. It just came in last month. So I brought a few of them here, and, and actually I have material in the back. So we'll, we'll go over this stuff later. But um, this is probably, as far as I'm concerned, outside the Bible, is the best book on creation out there. It lays it out from in the beginning all the way through day 7. And I think I hopefully take care of a lot of stuff in it. Well, anyway, advertisement. You know, you have to have those, those moments where you stop and you advertise what, what you got going on. Well, okay, Romans chapter 4. We're getting back into faith. And, and in Romans chapter 4, we're going to see the definition of faith and how it works and the mechanics of it. You see, I like to take things apart and, and, and look and learn how they work. You know what? My, my favorite television show is Columbo. Okay, now I don't know if any of you guys remember Columbo, if you're as old as I am or not, but Columbo was on a long time ago. And Columbo, the reason I like the show is because he would stumble around and he would find a clue, something that was out of place, and he knew that clue had to lead somewhere, and he would eventually follow that thread and unravel the whole truth, right? Well, that's how I like to, to, to do my Bible study. I find something that, that's really fascinating, like faith, and I like to follow it through and see how it works and the truth that it unravels. And in Romans chapter 4 here, verse 20, we're going to see some things about faith and how it works. He's going to take us to Abraham, but verse 20, let's, say, let's just start there. Who He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He's talking about Abraham. And we'll go up a couple verses in a minute. But was strong in faith, giving glory to God. We're going to see a picture here of Abraham being strong in the faith. Let's go up to verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, 
He considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. And he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. What happened to Abraham here? Abraham's about a hundred years old, and God tells him he's going to have a child. Well, even back then, when you're a hundred, it's really hard to have a child. Because the body sort of just died. It doesn't really work as well in the reproductive areas as it used to when you were younger. Okay? And so God tells Abraham, you're going to have a child. And Abraham looks at himself and he says, there's no way I can do that. My body's dead. And he looks at Sarah and she was just as barren as he was. Unable to produce a child. But God makes a promise to Abraham that he was going to have a child. And we learn here in verse, verse 20... There was a promise made. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Abraham didn't stagger at that promise. He heard this promise, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham was strong in his faith in regards to what God told him. Well, in verse 21, we're going to see the mechanics of faith and what is required for faith. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. There's your mechanics of faith, and we're going to go through this verse. But as it's sort of like a demonstration of what faith is, I got something here. In this envelope is something everybody's going to want. It's a gift card to Subway. I will give it to the first person that raises both their hands and say, Gary, you're great. Gary, you're great. Oh, right there. She beat you. <laughs> All right. What's your name? Tammy. Tammy? Okay, my hearing's going a little bit too. I think I'm reaching those ages. Tammy. All right, we'll talk more about Tammy a little bit later. You don't mind if I pick on you a little bit during, the, during this. Okay. Just give me my supper. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. What you just witnessed, though, was faith. Something that came out of nothing. You just witnessed an act of faith, and we're going to describe exactly how that all happened. It's the same thing Abraham does. It's the same thing people do every single day. Now let's drop down to verse 21 and get into this thing. We're going to see the mechanics of it here. And being fully persuaded, he's talking about Abraham's strong faith, that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Now let's see if these things work. All right, we're talking about faith. The very first thing you need in order for faith to be activated, in order for faith to happen, is a promise. Verse 21, And being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was also able to perform. The, to, for faith to be initiated, the igniter, the spark that starts any type of faith is some type of promise. Okay? Now, what is a promise? A promise is a statement or a declaration of something that's going to take place in the future. Okay? That's what a promise is. You can't promise things that happened in the past because we can't really go back in the past and undo anything in the past. You can only make promises about the future. I made a promise to Tammy that I would give her a gift card. Well, not to her. I made a promise to actually all of you. And she did something. Now, she either acted out of faith or she acted out of greed, I don't know. Or <laughs> hunger. Maybe she's hungrier than the rest of you. But we'll find out later. What drove her? Maybe her, her hunger and her greed drove her to have that faith. But we'll see. But the very first thing you, know, you, you need to have is a promise. That's very first. And, and promises, you know, the thing about promises, they're really easy to make, aren't they? We can all make promises. I made a promise with Tammy already. That was easy. We'll find out if I was lying or not. I don't know if I want to give up my subway card. <laughs> but promises are easy to make. And, and, and you, that's going to be part of this faith issue, is, is, is looking at whether they can be whether you're persuaded about them. And so when we talk about promises, you can make a little promise, like our arrangement here, subway gift card, is a little promise. But if I said, if I was now saying, if you invest all your money with me, I guarantee you a 20% return in, oh, in your retirement, that's a much bigger promise, isn't it? And you know what happens with the promises? The consequences go up with the promises. As the promises are made grander, those of you that believe them, your consequences go up. 
Now, if Tammy doesn't get her gift card today, I think she's going to be okay with it. I'm hoping. <laughs> but if I took all her money and said I was going to invest it and give her a 20 cent return, 20, 20 cent return, that would be nice for me. No, 20% return, and then never did. See, the consequences grow. So with promises, when we talk about promises, we want to talk about what promise is the most important promise that somebody can make. Well, if I promised you a million dollars, you'd all be pretty happy. That's a pretty big promise. If I promised you a really good job, that's a pretty big promise. If I promised you fame, that's a, that'd be a pretty nice promise. But you know what the problem with all those promises are? When you die, you can't enjoy the promise, can you? So the best promise somebody can make you is what we would call eternal. That's the grandest promise out there. Without life, it doesn't matter what you have, you're eventually going to die. I know people with really cool sports cars that really like to drive them, and you know what happened when they died? Those sports cars are still there, the guy's buried in the ground, he can't use them and can't enjoy them anymore. That's the problem with life. You need life in order to enjoy everything else. So the best promise somebody can make is eternal life. You know, everybody wants life, don't we? Because we all know we need it to enjoy the things around us. That's why, you know, when we get sick, where do you go? To the hospital. Why do you go to the hospital? Because you want to be made better. We all want to live really long. We all want to live really old. Because as the older we get, we keep enjoying the things we have. Now, as a side note, everybody wants to live to be 100. I had a grandma who lived to be 107. Exactly. Wow. I've seen 107. You don't want to be 107. <laughs> okay, sorry. News flash. The body starts to corrupt really fast after 100. For most of us, it starts earlier in life. But I'll tell you, by the time you're 107, it's not that much fun to be alive around down here. You can't really do much. But anyway, we're all going to die, so we all need eternal life. And that's, you know, amazingly, that's exactly the promise God makes us. Turn over to Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. This is amazing. This is the same promise God makes. Titus 1, verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. You know when God said about His creation and creating everything, you know what He promised Himself? That He would give His creation the ability to have eternal life because God created everything with an eternal purpose in mind. God never created with the purpose that He was just going to discard it after thousand years or a million years or it would run down. God created initially with the promise that he wanted his creation to be able to enjoy him forever so he made a promise of eternal life. That's wonderful. I go through that a little bit. Give you insight into how loving and how caring God is is that when he set out to create, he created a creation that he wanted to live with him forever. That's cool. That tells me a lot about God. He's a lot of... God's great to worship. He's a great God. He takes care of us. He's thought about everything from before He made anything. So God makes this promise. We'll put God here. God makes the promise of eternal life. The biggest, best promise that could be made. There's no bigger promise that somebody can make. Well, you know what? God's not the only person, though, that's promised eternal life. There's another person out there that has promised eternal life, and that's Satan. And a lot of men who follow after him. You go back to Genesis chapter 3. Let's go back there for a second. See, like I said, it's easy to make promises. And Satan makes this promise. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. 
And the serpent said unto the woman, we all know this, ye shall what? Not surely die. You know what that is? That's eternal life. If you're not going to die ever, what do you have? Eternal life. So both God and Satan have made a promise. They both promise eternal life. So you got this promise out there, and man is sitting in here. We hear this promise. Satan's promise is preached everywhere, isn't it? You can hear Satan's promise of eternal life preached in most churches. You can hear it preached in education. You hear it preached from just about everybody around you. What, what, any, when, when people die, where do they all go according to the world? Heaven. The guy could be the biggest dream of his whole life, but they die, and all of a sudden he was the best guy going. You ever listen? Oh, if you ever knew him personally? Oh, it's like you just want to, well, it's just bad. He didn't have Well, did you know what he was really like? No, I don't think so. The only person in hell, according to the world, is Hitler. And, and, and maybe Osama bin Laden. That's it. Hell is like empty other than a couple people down there. We live in a world of crazy. You know, just be real and look at life. Anyway, we got two promises. One by Satan, one by, one by God. Now, what are we supposed to do? Let's go back to Romans chapter uh, 4. What did Abe, what, what's the next thing on the list of faith? When there's a promise made, 421, talking about Abraham, but talking about what faith is, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. There has to be an ability, once a promise is made, there has to be an ability to perform that promise. That's up to us to start to look at now and invest. Here we have two promises, one by God. Now it's up to us to see, it asks the question, which one can perform that promise? Now when I raised my card and Tammy raised her hands in excited jubilation because she wanted something, <laughs> she probably looked at me and said, he's probably got enough money to stop at Subway and get a gift card. And, and it's not like he was saying there was a million dollar lottery ticket in there. So he could perform that promise. Therefore, she raised her hand and said, Gary is great. The reason I like saying Gary is great is because I do magic shows and, um, for, for, for kids and, and, and whatever. And my magic word is Gary is great instead of ever. ever. No, that's okay. <laughs> hey, you got to do something with the kids that make me look good. <laughs> and so every time I do something, what's the magic word? Gary is great. Yes, and it happens. So anyway. I, don't worry, I don't have a problem with uh, self-image or anything like that. <laughs> no. I already think I'm great, so that's okay. I don't need to hear it, but it's just nice when people say it back to me. My wife says it every night, so. <laughs> you were great. <laughs> so that's all right. No. We're talking about the ability to perform. Who can perform? Now, it's up to us now. We got these two promises made, one by God, one by Satan, and we have to look at it, which one could perform it. Well, first, go back over to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. We've already read it, but I want to point out another thing about this. In hope of eternal life, which God... Who made the promise? God made the promise. Okay, so when I first looking at these two, I know God made that promise. Who is God? Well, God's God. Well, what makes up God? Well, God's all-present. He's all-powerful. He's all-present. Powerful. And all-knowing. He's more than that. He's all-loving. He's all-just. He's all-merciful. He's all-kind. He's all-peaceful. It, it, he's he's all-of-everything. But you have to have those three to be God. Because if you don't have those three, you know what you are? You're not a big G God. You're going to end up being a little G God, right? 
See, there's a difference between the big God and everybody else who claims to be God. So when I start looking at this, who can perform it, I know God is God because He is everything. There's nothing he doesn't know. There's nothing he can't do. There's nowhere he is not. All right? When I come over and I look at Satan, is Satan these things? No. It's okay to talk back to me as long as it's nice. No. I know somebody was saying, you know, they were going to yell at me if I was wrong or bad or boring or something. I'm like, that's okay. It's been done before. But Satan's not God. Is Satan all present? No. Is Satan all-powerful? No. Is Satan all-knowing? No. Now, side note if you want something about Satan that I think about, is that Satan, he doesn't know everything. But Satan's got a lot of angelic creation or creatures underneath him that help him out, doesn't he? So Satan's got a really large database. He does, because everything's being funneled back to him. I don't know what type of computer he has, but I'm sure it's a really awesome supercomputer. Or maybe he can keep it in his head. But I think about these things, which I probably, well, it's fun to think about what he's doing. Because he's not all-knowing, but yet he wants to be. So he set up a network through his, through his angelic creatures that are following him to help him accumulate knowledge. But he will never be all-knowing. Therefore, he's a little g guy. So therefore, when I start to look at this promise, I start to say, hmm, maybe God can do it and Satan can't because Satan's just a little G God and that's a really big promise for somebody to make. Well let's continue down in Titus chapter 1 verse 2. In hope of eternal life that God that cannot lie. See this is one of my favorite verses. Every time I come to the scripture, well not every time but a lot of times I come to the scripture, this verse pops in my head first. Every time I read this book I know God is not lying to me. Isn't that awesome? God tells you exactly how it is. We're going to get over to Romans a little bit, and he's going to tell you, man, it's no good. Terrible. You know, that was my problem. You know, well, maybe not my problem, but that's sort of how I raised my kids. I was real with them. If they were good at something, I said they were good. If they were bad at something, I said they were bad. I never gave them that full imagination they were going to be good at something when they were, I knew they were going to be bad. Might have crushed a few dreams along the way, but oh well, that's reality. God tells you how it is. He does not lie. Okay? Turn over to John. Oh, let's see. John, where am I going to go? No. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 44. John 8, 44. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. 8.44. Something about Satan. 8.44. We probably are familiar with this passage. Ye of your father the devil. Talking about Satan here. The lust of your father he will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And abode not in the truth because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar. While here we say... God doesn't lie, but we've learned that Satan is a what? Liar. You're starting to see which one you want to believe, maybe? Which one you want to place your faith in? They both made the same promise. But as we start to investigate and look at each one, we see God's God. God doesn't lie. But Satan, he likes to lie. So maybe he's not telling us the truth about that promise of eternal life. And now as we start to investigate can they perform it, they each teach that they can. We touched on this earlier. Satan's got a whole religion out there that teaches man can have eternal life but through your good works. By being good. And some people don't even have to be that good. I mean, if I was unsaved and I had to pick a religion, I would pick one that didn't have really high standards. Because it would be easier to have eternal life if I had to pick one where I didn't really have to do all that much. I don't know why these people go and pick a religion that's so hard. Oh! I, I, I talked to a lady just the other day, and she was Catholic. And as she was younger, one of her things she was going to do, she was going to be a nun, but not just a normal nun. That was in the cloister. Close, what are they? Cloisters. Cloisters. Oh! Then you hear what those people do. Nothing. 
or then sit in a dark room and pray for the world. What kind of... That's torture. Pick an easier position. He said, huh? It's like this. My daughter came home. She wants to, she tells me one day she's going to go out for the cross country team. My reaction was, why? I hate running. Why run? Running is torturous to me. Pick something easier. That's why we invented the car. I love getting in my car and driving. She's going to cross country 12 or 14 miles. Ugh! I'd have a stroke doing that. But I did learn it's fun. You know what was fun about that? It was fun to watch. <laughs> because they ran in forest preserves, and I still remember taking my lawn chair out to this beautiful forest preserve or golf courses where they ran. I sat it down, I got to sit down and watch them all run. It was really fun for me. But if I had to pick a religion, I'd pick an easy one. <laughs> but not everybody does. Some people pick these hard ones. Some people Pick that one where they think if they blow themselves up, they're going to go to heaven. Oh, who would pick that one in their right mind? Not me. Anyway, Satan's got all these... Oh, I don't have my book, but I got a book on Cain and Abel back there that goes through man's religion. You got to get it, you got to read it. And I'll go through more of that maybe tomorrow. But my wife says it's so good, you got to buy two because you're going to want to read it twice. <laughs> I know, she's shaking her head. No, you, you didn't say that again, did you? She, she regrets the day she told me that. <laughs> because I use it everywhere I go. She's like, no, don't do that one, and then just don't ask me about cats, because I got a good cat joke, but don't, we'll, we'll get to that later. No, point is, is man's religion all comes from Satan. It's all the same. I don't care if you're Jehovah's Witness, if you're Mormon, if you're Islam. It's all the same. It's a works-based religion. You're going to make it. And Satan's lie is standing there at the door saying, you can do it. Well, God says that's a lie. Satan's lying to you. And remember what we started out when we said is the promises get bigger, the consequences get bigger? Well, let me tell you, the consequences of having eternal life, there is no greater consequence than leaving this planet without it, is there? Because the consequence is suffering underneath the damnation of God eternally in hell and the lake of fire. Which I also have a book on hell on the back there, which you got to get. <laughs> I know. Little advertisements as we go through. But they're good spiritual food for you guys to know and, and have and eat up. But anyway, let's get back to where we were. We were in John, talking about the devil. And, and turn, turn back over a page to John chapter 7. Um, oh, actually, not a page, a couple books. Matthew chapter 7. Close enough. All right. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. The Lord, talking about Satan's way, talking about the way that people travel to gain Satan's promise of eternal life. He says here, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate. And broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And there be many, and, and many there be which go in thereat. You see, God knows the way of Satan, there's a lot of people following, aren't there? Look, I, drove, I got to Bedford today, or last night. I drove through town. It's sort of really pretty town you guys have here. Really, really nice. I like seeing from 18 whatever, early 1800s, you know, really. Really nice rustic, I mean not rustic, maybe, it, would you declare it rustic? Maybe it's rustic. Historic, historic place. It's beautiful here. And, and, but the problem is, we have a meeting tonight and there's like, what? That town should be here. You know where the whole town is? Down that as far as I'm concerned, every time a, a meeting like this, this place should be beaming out the doors with people trying to get in. Dave should be uh, at, the, at the entrance out there trying to, trying to get all the cars in. I didn't see him with the flashlights. <laughs> we got churches next to me. It's sad. We got churches next to me that pump in twenty to 25,000 people of service. That's how big they are. They got the people with the flashlights. And you know where they're all leading them? Down the road of destruction. Oh, they got the social gospel. Be good, be happy, clean the environment, everything's going to be good in the end. Yeah, right. My dad had some environmentalists show up at his door a while ago. 
Stay whales. Help us clean the oceans. Donate money. My dad says, why are you trying to save this planet? God tells me he's going to burn it up soon. They didn't like that. We were the first global warming. And it's going to happen like that. Al Gore doesn't know what's coming. But he should. God's got a global warming coming, all right. He's going to, bam, he's going to burn everything up. But Matthew, verse 14, because the straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few be there that find it. God says the way to eternal life is narrow, and, it, and it's not narrow because it's hard to find. It's narrow because there's not a lot of people walking down that trail. You ever notice, around here, I, I notice, I start driving around. Your roads are small. A lot of two-lane roads. I go this way, they come that way. You go to Chicago, we don't have any two-lane roads. They're mostly six lanes now. Three this way, three this way. In neighborhoods. It's nuts. You know why those roads are so big? Because there's so many people. You don't have the people we have, so your roads are narrow. Well, that's what God's saying here. The way to destruction that, that Satan leads is wide in comparison to the way God leads because there's not many people following after God. It's not that it's hard to find or it's a hard road to travel. It's actually an easy road to travel. We're going to see it's by faith. Satan's road is hard to travel, but people like it, unfortunately. That's the difference there. You know, a lot of people come to that passage and they say, Oh, faith is hard. God's way is narrow. It's hard to get through. No, it's not. It's just narrow because there's not a lot of people going with you. Sometimes you feel like you're by yourself. Don't you? That's why I like coming out to places like this. Because it's really nice meeting other saints that are traveling down the road to eternal life that I'm walking with. Now, I may not have met you before. Well, I haven't met you. A couple of you have met before. But most I haven't. But it's nice now, when I go back home, I know there's others walking with me. And our way may be narrow, but that's okay. I wish it was wide. I wish God had to build an expressway because so many people were coming with us. But, oh well. Just how it is. Okay, turn back over. Let's see, where do we want to go now? Turn back over to uh, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Okay, now, we're, t we're talking about this promise of eternal life that God wants to give. And God wants to give that promise to everybody. We talked how Satan says you can have it by being good, basically. That's his message. God looks at man, and he's made a promise to give him eternal life. But when God wants to give it to man, something happened that makes it a lot more difficult for God to fulfill that promise. And that was sin. What's God to do? See, when people sin, you bring upon yourself the damnation and condemnation of God, which is the exact opposite of life. So God's made this promise to himself that he's going to give eternal life and then he goes to do it, and he can't because there's something stopping him in the way, and that is sin. He can't just give you eternal life as a sinner. That'd be unjust, according to him. I wouldn't want it anyway. Can you imagine having eternal life as a sinner? Continually doing the sins you've always done forever. You know what I think about? It's like this. I'm glad God shortened lifespans down. Think about this. Imagine you're 900 years old and you've been addicted to alcohol for 830 of them. I'm not kidding. We have people who get addicted for alcohol and they die at 70 and they've been addicted for 40 years. Can you imagine being addicted to something for 400 years? You know the evil person you would turn... I'm so glad God took that life from 900 and shortened it down to about 70. Think about it. If you're addicted to cocaine and you're shooting yourself up for 600 years? I'm not kidding. Or any of those things that people get into. Oh, terrible. Fortunately, that's one of the reasons why God shortened it down, because he knew it didn't take 900 years for you guys to understand this promise and, and put your faith in him. He knew you could do it 
in a relatively short period of time. But anyway, side note, back to where we were. God's got this problem of sin. He wants to give eternal life, but he just can't because sin keeps popping up. God actually looked upon the earth. Let's, uh, let's first go to Psalms chapter 14. Psalms, Psalms 14. Verse uh, 2. You see, God's got this promise and he wants to give it. So he looks down from heaven. Verse 2. And the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men. He looks at everybody to see if there were any that understood and seek God. God looked from heaven to see if there was anybody that was deserving of eternal life. And you know what he found? They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. God's got this promise. He's like, oh, he can't wait to give it. And he looks down on man. And he can't find a single person he can give it to because we are all sinners. Go back to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 6. This is, you know, I started this up. God's real. He doesn't lie. You ever, Romans chapter 2, Romans, the beginning of Romans chapter 3, and Romans chapter 1, those are hard chapters to read when you put your name in there. And you should. Because they're written about every single person. He tells you, uh, let's just drop down. Well, okay, let's, we're going to drop down to verse 7, or verse 6. God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well doing seek for glory and honor, immortality, eternal life. God says when he judges every single person, he's going to look to see if he can give them eternal life. And if they've been good continually their whole life, he will give you eternal life. Do you see that? If you can continually be good and never sin, God will give you eternal life. But, that, but there's a problem. Verse 8, But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Oh, every time I read that I get scared. Because that verse says God's going to pour out his tribulation, anger, and wrath upon every single person that does what? Evil. You know who that is? Me and you. I was born in sin. Just because I was raised in a home that knew the grace message and that knew who Jesus Christ was, I was still born a sinner. And that verse is talking about every single person. That verse is talking about your neighbor. That verse is talking about your relatives. That verse is talking about everybody you know. When they get judged by God, if they are evil, God will pour out His wrath upon them. If that's how they appear before Him. So God can't give eternal life to everybody because there was this problem of sin. Continue down. Let's just jump over to Romans chapter um, 3. We'll start in verse 11. Verse 10, actually. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all going out of the way. Doesn't that sound a lot like Psalms? Everybody's a sinner. God can't just willy-nilly give out eternal life because everybody falls underneath the judgment of God. That's the exact opposite of what Satan says, isn't it? Satan says, that's not going to happen. If you're good, you'll get it. God says, no. You're not good. You know, that's something we all need to know. We're not good people. That's okay. This is like a good therapy session. We can all let it out now. We can all be... Hey, I'm not good. It's okay. You can all say it back to me. It's all right. No, that's okay. You don't have to. Don't mind to go deaf. Um, but we're all evil. We all, none of us. We're all sinners. So what was God to do? Well, fortunately, God had a plan, didn't he? He had a way to fulfill this promise before the world began. He knew what he was going to do. If his creation rebelled against him, God had a plan for that. Turn over to Hebrews. Chapter 10, Hebrews, chapter 10. This is a great passage, Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to go to verse 4. Um, this passage is like getting in a time machine 
And God's going to take us all the way back a couple thousand years to right before Christ left heaven to come down and die on the cross for our sins. This passage is a conversation God had within himself. And this is what was in the mind that they were talking about. Verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. You know, God gave the law and he gave the animal sacrifices to people. But you know, even with that, man still wasn't good. Even if you did all those animal sacrifices perfectly, you were still evil. Because God says the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. Verse 5, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith. This takes us back to right before Christ leaves heaven's glory. There's a conversation Christ is having with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. And this is what he said. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. Christ says to the Father and the Holy Spirit, the animal sacrifices didn't do it. But there's a body that's being made for me. You know where that body was being made? The womb of Mary. There was a special body that was made that could house both God and man together. Do you see that? You know, you ever... This is what I don't get. This is the... Luke, go to Luke chapter 1. I'll just throw this in for fun. Hopefully you guys... Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 1. You ever have somebody come up to you and say, Oh, you're King James. You're King James. You're, you're wrong. The Bible's wrong. Look, they, they, they'll take you to verse 35. And I don't know if you've had this happen to you. I've had this happen to me. But I just gave you the answer to one of the big things. They say, well, verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. They say your King James Bible is wrong because it just called God a thing. Do you see that? I don't know if you've ever heard that argument before. I have. How can that be a thing? I just gave you the answer in Hebrews. What did Christ call that was being made for him? A what? A body? Do you, do you see? Let's go back to Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 5. Oh, I should have told you to keep your finger there. Hebrews chapter 5. I mean, I'm, chapter 10, verse 5. Boy, I'm losing it now. It's past 8 o'clock. I'm usually in bed by now. No, that's okay. I'm just waking up. I just found out I'm staying over at the travel lodge. I was telling my wife all day, I can't wait till I get home and go to sleep, get a good night tonight. I just found out I got the worst neighbors that could have moved in next to me. They are rambunctious and wild. They pulled in. They had their music blaring out of their car so much. I thought the, 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 the gang down the street from Chicago just moved in next to me. And here it's Dan Gross. <laughs> you seen nothing. I, exactly. I was looking forward to getting over there and putting my head on the pillow. Now I know it's going to be all wild stuff. So I gotta get back to the hotel and request a different room. <laughs> One away from the, the grosses. You need a different hotel. Different, oh no! I might be sleeping in the pew. Actually, this is bad. I went to a conference earlier in the year uh, and I got there about 2 in the morning. My daughter and I pulled in. And this was one of those rush. You, 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 they don't, the middle of nowhere, everything's. Um, very, very primitive and rustic. Well, I ended up sleeping on the pew because I was sleeping. So uh, I might be sleeping on the pew tonight might be and, and quieter than over at the hotel. So if you come in tomorrow and you have to wake me up, it's okay. You know what happened and who to blame. <laughs> it's terrible. Okay, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. That, that thing in Luke chapter 1 is this body. Christ calls it a body that's being made for him. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hadst no pleasure. Christ is talking to the Father. You've had no pleasure. Verse 7 is a great verse. Then, can you imagine Christ saying this? Then said I, 
Lo, I come in the volume of book it is of written of me to do thy will, God. Price says it's in the volume of the book, this book. He's going to leave heaven and do something that him and the Father and the Holy Spirit have planned to do for a very long time. That's amazing. Christ could have said, Ah, oh, I don't want to go now. Look at those guys. They're not worth it. And he would have been right and just in doing that, wouldn't have you? I look at mankind. I don't think I'd die for any of them. I'm scared to die anyway, but that's another story. No, I'm not. <laughs> I just, I just tell people, I hope when I die it's quick. And I tell people, don't tell me anything you don't want people to know because if, if somebody gets me and they start to interrogate me and they come at me with a needle, I'm going to tell them everything. <laughs> so I'm scared to death of needles. All it's going to take is one little needle and I'll be like, oh, hey, whatever you want to know. No, but Christ says, Lo, in the volume of the book, I come to do thy will. Verse 8, above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein which are offered by the law. He's saying those sacrifices were useless. Verse 9, then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second, by which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Christ says, I'm leaving heaven to do the will that we have planned since the beginning of creation. Isn't that cool? You just sat in a conversation that God had with himself. Now let's fast forward to where we are. Okay, now, time machine's over. Pretty neat though. That's fascinating when I read that. So Christ says, he's going to come and do something to pay for that problem. And you know why he's doing that? He's doing that so God can fulfill his promise of eternal life. You see how all that works together? Isn't that fascinating? So what's God do? God comes down. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 5. God comes down. And what's he take upon himself? That body which was the flesh of men. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That verse is awesome. God, Jesus Christ does not have to rob God of stuff to make himself God. Do you, you get that? You know, if I want to be as... If I want to be as wealthy as some people, you know, wherever, I might have to break into their house and steal some of their money so I could have what they have, right? Well, Christ doesn't have to break into God and take anything to be God because Christ is everything God is. He doesn't have to rob God. You know who teaches you have to rob God? Satan. Satan's robbing God all the time. He wants to rob him of eternal life. And all those things. I go through that in my cane book too, so there's another reason to get it. Robbing God. The church today Religion is trying to rob God of everything. And God's like, no way, you ain't, you're not stealing from me. I, I know, I, I, I shouldn't use the word ain't. We're in the north. When I go down south, I can say ain't, but not up here. Okay, so I got to watch that. But anyway, he's equal with God. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men. We saw that body that made, that was made for Jesus Christ, so Jesus Christ can be both God and man in the flesh. Isn't that fascinating? He took upon himself something. He didn't take anything else. He took upon himself the form of man. Verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the what? Cross. Cross. Hallelujah! Christ took upon himself the form of man, so he could die on that cross. He did that so God can perform the promise that was made before the world began of granting eternal life. He did that so that way sin becomes a non-issue. Turn back over to Romans chapter 5. These are some of my favorite verses. Romans chapter 5. Verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for who? 
The ungodly. Who's the ungodly? We are. We just read in Romans chapter 2 that we're all ungodly, we're all evil. Christ died for all of us. I love this verse. It says, for when we were yet without strength. I like that because I'm not a very big person. I'm a skinny little guy. I've never had the strength to do a whole lot. It's okay. I was at a conference and there we were, you could teach, it was really one of those that you just, in the farm field basically. So we're our short, I was teaching there. And one of your guys called me pelican legs. <laughs> My legs are like this big. That's okay. I don't care, I don't have the strength maybe some of the other people do. It, I've learned to deal with that. A lot of years of therapy. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> the steroids. They didn't work. No. No, I, I actually didn't, but that's okay. I maybe should have, but it doesn't really matter. This verse is wonderful, though. This says, for when we were yet without strength. I don't have the strength to get to heaven. I can't reach up to get it. You know that? be good enough to get it. I love this verse. All of religion should be following this verse. They don't have the strength to do it, but they think they can. They that Catholic telling you thought that if she went and got that, what's that word again? Clostered? Cloistered. Cloistered. I have a real problem with words reaching my tongue. <laughs> and they all come out wrong. So a lot of times I, I have these words that we like made up words by Gary. They're like two or three words all put together. And so cloister is a word that I can already tell I'm going to have a hard time getting from here to here because it's not a normal thing to say. But anyway, she was going to be cloistered hoping she could get eternal life doing good and that was never going to work. She thought through her own strength she could pray enough and be holy enough and make it to heaven. You know what? That was never going to work. I like reading Martin Luther. I know who came to the Catholic movement years and years ago. And when I read him, he talks about being at the bedside of priests he revered, priests he thought were good their whole life, and seeing them die in terror because they never knew if they did enough good when they went and met God. That was one of the things that caused him to rethink what he was being taught. He saw men who he thought had done so much good, wore the hair rags, walked on their knees for miles, whipped themselves, and they died in fear because they never knew if they had done enough. If I were to die, I know I haven't done enough and I'm going to die happy because I know he did enough for me. It's not on me. I am so glad I didn't do anything for it. You know that? You know what I find when I work on stuff or do things? I break things a lot. I hate that. I, I had to switch out an engine the other day on a, one of the lawnmowers. I mean, I do landscaping and stuff like that. And I, I had to switch out an engine. And I got, put the old one off, put the new one on, got it bolted up, had to redo some stuff on it. And then I go to put the muffler on. Well, it's a different muffler than the old engine. So I go to put it on. And here, I can't get it on because the engine's on the lawnmower already. And I got to take the engine off to put the muffler on. I had to undo all the work I just spent two and a half hours doing. Then I'm back under there, taking off the same boat I just put in. You know how frustrating that is? That's not fun. But when I think about that and I think about my salvation, I'm like, oh, good. I didn't have to do anything for my salvation because Jesus Christ, he did it all. He did it all for me. I thank God for that. So when I'm at home and I go to bed at night, or if I'm going to die, I'm not, I don't plan on being scared unless if there's a needle around. <laughs> but man, that's going to be wonderful. Can you imagine closing your eyes knowing you're going to wake up with the Lord? Oh, that's great. To be absent from their bodies, to be present where? With the Lord. That's wonderful. So Jesus Christ comes and he dies for those who have no strength. Drop down to verse 8. But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know all that stuff we read in Romans chapter 2? That was to prep you the fact that you are a sinner. You need a Savior. Jesus Christ. Where is he? Right here. So when I 
start to investigate which, which one could fulfill the promise, I see God over here with the promise. He's God. He doesn't lie. And then I see what God did for us. And you know what? Jesus Christ is God, isn't he? Whose blood was shed on the cross according to Acts? It was the blood of God. Is that a little G God or a big G God? Big G, big G God. Does that mean Christ is all these? Exactly. You know, Satan's over here. He's got other. Satan's not stupid. He sees God's got a Jesus. Satan says, oh, I, I need some Jesuses on my team. You know who has got... You ever have a Jehovah's Witness come to your door? You know who they have on their team? A Jesus. You ever talk... You start talking to them, they got a Jesus too. But their Jesus is not this Jesus. Their Jesus is not God. Whenever I talk to a Jehovah's Witness, I take them right to Jesus. Who's your Jesus? Does he, is he all powerful? Is he all knowing? Is he all present? No, no, no. Well then you got a different Jesus. You know who else has a Jesus? The Mormons. They got a Jesus. So you got to be careful what Jesus you're believing. You know who also has a Jesus? Islam. Whoa! You guys know that, don't you? They have a Jesus. Those Jesuses cannot save you. You put your faith in the Jesus of Islam, you're going to hell. Your faith in the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witness, you're going to hell. It's a one-way ticket right there. Because their Jesus is not God. Their Jesus is a little G God. And anybody that comes along and tells you to believe in a Jesus that doesn't, isn't all these, you know what you're listening to? You're listening to the devil's Jesus. My Jesus of the Bible is God. Big G God. I can't get saved through a little G Jesus, can you? Because he's not God. I can't get saved through the Mormon Jesus. very close. Oh, he died. But they won't say it's by faith alone. They add some things. They try and steal Jesus. And they got a Jesus on their team. That's, see, Satan's not stupid. He sees this Jesus appear and he's like, oh, I need some too. To confuse them. But their Jesus is a little G-God. Our Jesus, the one that saves you. Here, turn over to Acts. Acts chapter, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, no, 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. You see that God? Is that a big G God? Oh yeah, it is. That's this God right here. Which he hath purchased with his own blood. Who's that talking about? Who made the purchase with his blood? Jesus Christ. This verse just told you Jesus Christ is a big G God. You better believe in the big G God. In the big God, Jesus. So when those Mormons come to my door, you know, I don't think I had a Mormon come to my door. They don't go out do that. But when those Jehovah's Witnesses do, I take them right to Jesus. They who Jesus is. My Jesus versus your Jesus. Which one's powerful? Which one do you want to believe in? One that can't do everything that my Jesus can? No way. I want this one. That's why I'm, I'm thrilled to be saved. I, I got a God that's everything. I'm not trusting in a small g God hoping that he can figure out along the way. Let's get on with this. So, back to Romans chapter 4. What's the last thing in faith? Yeah, okay, we'll get it done here in a little bit. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to what? Perform. He was, Christ, God made a promise he can perform it, then the last thing in faith is being persuaded. Faith 
is comprised of the three P's. You ever watch Wheel of Fortune and they have that clue up there that says same letter? Nobody watch Wheel of Fortune here? Boy, I guess not. Okay, some people do. They got little things, you know, guess what the words are, and they got this one puzzle where same letter, where the whole first letter is the same for every clue. It's the same thing here. You call me Pat Sajak and Vanna White. No, that's okay. <laughs> it's the three P's of faith. Faith is comprised of these three things. You have to have a promise. You have to then be able to perform it, and the person you've made the promise to has to be persuaded. Look at Abraham. God made Abraham a promise that he would have a child. Verse 21, Abraham, talking about Abraham's faith, it says he was fully persuaded. Abraham was persuaded. That's the last step. That's what makes faith. You need these ingredients to make faith real. This is a dish, a cake you bake. You need a promise. You need some performance ability, and then you need to be persuaded that it can happen. That's what faith is. And Paul and, and Abraham was persuaded. Let's turn turn over to, to um, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Oh, this is one of my favorite verses too. You're going to see why. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Oh, this, hopefully you all really enjoy this verse and if not hopefully you do after we go through it for that for then this is talking about Paul for the which cause I also suffered these things nevertheless I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day Paul was persuaded about some things do you see that there Paul was persuaded, in the middle, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he, God, is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. You know what I have committed unto God? My eternal future. I have committed that into his trust and I am persuaded that he's going to fulfill that promise. Do you see that? Paul had committed a lot of things to God and we all do. I have committed my sins to him that he's forgiven them all. And I am persuaded that he has. I've committed my eternal life to him. And I am persuaded that he will keep and do what he has promised me. I hope you have too. That's a wonderful passage. It's a wonderful verse. Paul is saying he's committed all these things to the Lord. You know what? We also learn I'm, when I get saved, I'm an adopted child of God. Can you imagine me being adopted into God's family? Now some of you may be like, wow, you're my brother <laughs> in my family. I'm like on the low end of the family scale, but I don't care. I'm in it. And I'm happy to be in it. That's awesome. I've committed that to him. When I get there, it's going to be one big family reunion. Isn't it? That's awesome. These are things Paul is committed into God's care and Paul was persuaded that God will do those things. That's what faith is. It's believing, it's being persuaded in regards to a promise and in order to be persuaded you look at God's ability or anybody's ability to perform it. Turn over to uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 13. In whom also ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that ye believed. You see, believed, trusted, being persuaded are all the same. He, well, well, watch, let's read this again. In whom ye also trusted. How did you trust? How did you have faith after ye heard the what? The word of truth. The promise. In order to have faith, you have to hear the promise first. You know, you can't have faith if you never hear what's being promised, can you? 
No, there's nothing to, there's nothing to start faith with. You have to hear the... You know why it's so important that the Bible stay pure? Because in the pure Bible, you find the pure promises of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word of God. Without a word of God, it's hard to believe, isn't it? You don't know what to... You can't have faith. In whom also ye trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that if ye believed, you were persuaded. I'll tell you, I've been persuaded that God can fulfill His promise of eternal life because I know He can perform it because Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. When you've been persuaded to that, you have faith and you're saved, God says. is that awesome? That's it. That's faith. Now, Paul tells us, what do we do as Christians? We are to go out now and try and persuade other people to think and believe this. Turn over to Acts chapter 18. That's exactly what Paul did. Acts chapter 18. Verse 4. What did Paul do when he went into somewhere new? Acts chapter 18, verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and did what? Persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Reasoning, persuading, trying to get other people to see the facts of the matter. See, unsaved people are over here. It's our job now to go out and try and persuade them to believe in the big G God. That's my job now. So I go out and I try and persuade those. Go to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24, verse 25. Paul, again, when he's dealing with people. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, uh, Drusilla. How would you like to have a name, Drusilla? Oh! What kind of mother gives their name? Is anybody here named Drusilla? Good. I can make fun of the name then. Who wants to be named Drus? It sounds like Dracula. Oh, terrible. There's some names in the Bible I would not want to name my kids. We all pick the good ones. Mike, John, I pick Luke, Sarah. No one picks Drusilla. Well, anyway, when she was a Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And Paul, and he reasoned, you see, Paul reasoned with Felix, trying to persuade Felix to believe this. You see that? Turn over to Acts chapter 26. Paul did the same with King Agrippa. King Agrippa calls Paul in, and Paul recounts everything to him. And King Agrippa, in verse 27, says... Uh, verse 28, actually, we'll just go to verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Paul just got done reasoning with him. King Agrippa says, verse 28, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost persuaded me. But he wasn't. You see, persuading is the issue of faith. You have to be persuaded in regards to a promise that that can be performed. That's faith. That's what it is. And as we go out, we are to persuade others and try and get them to, to see. We know in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're almost done. I know some of you are like, Dan's got to get back to the hotel. He's got a party to, to start up. <laughs> I saw him passing out flyers. I didn't know what they were. Now I know what they were. Show up. 9 o'clock party time. 118. Oh no, I could keep teaching and keep you here and then you couldn't have your party. <laughs> but that's alright. Maybe we'll just have it here. Um, where were we? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Um, oh yeah, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, what do we do? We what? Persuade men. Isn't that awesome? We go out and we persuade them. You better know this stuff. You know, if you want to be a good persuasive Persuasive. I don't even think that's a word. Persuasive person? Speaker? Persuasive speaker. That's it, right? Persuasive speaker. You have to know the subject you're talking about, don't you? If you don't know what you're talking about, it's going to be pretty hard to persuade some people to, your, 
to what God's doing. You have to know this. Then you're a better persuader person. <laughs> right? Sort of like mailman, I'm a persuader person. I guess. I don't know. Maybe you've never heard those two words put together. Neither have I, neither have I until right then. But it sounds pretty good. Persuader person. Oh well. Where were we? Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. We're almost done. Hebrews. I know. Your fingers are getting tired. That's okay. That's why God gave you ten of them. One gets tired, use the other nine. Hebrews chapter 11. Talk about faith. Verse, we'll just drop down to verse 13. And these, these all died in faith, not having received the what? Promises. But having seen them afar off and were what? Persuaded of them. The Old Testament saints heard promises of God and they were persuaded to them. Therefore they had faith. Therefore we'll see them in glory one day. Because God was able to grant eternal life to them. To look up a couple verses of Sarah. Sarah does the same thing. We'll just drop down verse 11. Uh, yeah, Hebrews 11, 11. Through faith, this is talking about Sarah now, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of child when she was past age because she, what? Judged him faithful. Judging. That's being persuaded. She looked at the promise of God and said, He is faithful. He can perform it. What's the verse continue on? Who had what? Promised. See, Sarah heard that promise of God and she thought about it and she said, He can do it. And she had faith. These are the three components of faith. That's how it works. That's what makes it up. Last thing. We'll just throw this in for fun. People say, Increase my faith, Lord. How many times have you heard Christians say, Oh, Lord, I had more faith. If only I had faith like Samson. Or maybe not Samson, but maybe I don't know. Pick your hero. I was never going to be a Samson, as I already told you. I could never lift the weight over my head. Football was not my sport. In fact, no sports were my sport in high school. But that's okay. Math, if math was a sport, I would have excelled. But it wasn't. I would do my math test and get 100 on it, and nobody standing there cheering for me like the football player did when he scored the touchdown. Bummer. Man, I wish I could rearrange society. I would make it different. Anyway, that, that's my dream. No, that's okay. Talking about how do you increase your faith? Well, it's not that complicated. When you hear another promise of God, what do you have the ability to do? Be persuaded with it and have more faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The more promises you hear, the more faith you can have because the more you can believe in. You know, God promises me that all my sins are forgiven. I, I am persuaded to that, therefore my faith has just doubled now. God promised me I am a child of God. I have been adopted into His family. So I am persuaded to that, therefore my faith faith has just tripled exponentially between double and triple and exponential. Woo, math, hard stuff. But anyway, I won't even go into it. Doesn't matter. Um, but your faith grows when you hear promises of God and you believe them. That's how your faith goes. God doesn't sprinkle faith over the side of heaven and say, here, you can have some and you can have less. No, His promises are all there. We can all have the same amount of faith if we all believed every promise of God. And that's where we all should be. But that's what faith is. So hopefully today, you've been persuaded in your mind that, oops, that God is worthy to be believed in regards to the promise of eternal life. And back to this. I know we were going to get back to this. I had made a promise that there was a gift card in some way. Faith in and her dad can do that. He was persuaded that I'm a really great guy and I'm not lying and that there's actually a gift card in some way. I hope that's what should have happened. Now maybe she was a little bit of, like I said, hunger. He got in there too and decided to 
not evaluate the person all that strongly because she just wanted the gift card. But I'm going to give this to her because I am a man of my word. And there you go, Tam. And all of you missed out because none of you were up saying Gary is great, were you? Other than Tammy. Well, Keith did too, but I don't have another one for you. My promise was to one person. Oh! Oh! No wonder! Birds of a feather flock together! Oh! Oh, you're probably going to be over at Dan's place later eating Subway! <laughs> oh, it figures! Oh, uh, why don't we close in a word of prayer and thank the Lord for the wonderful things He's given. Dear Lord, Oh, we just want to thank you and praise you for the wonderful things you've done. We thank you for your word and how you've preserved it for us and how you've, you, you, you've, you've made everything possible to fulfill your promise of eternal life. We thank you for the love that was shown to us through Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. We thank you for offering salvation as a free gift to all those who simply put their faith in what you did. And we know that when we put our faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that He paid for our sins on that cross, we are passed from death into life, and we have the free gift and the promise of eternal life. I mean, if there's anybody here that hasn't done that, may they be persuaded tonight and, and believe what you have done for us and become part of the family of God, and we can celebrate forever and ever in all eternity in your wonderful glory. In your name, amen. All right.